Folks, it's your boy here, Dr. Sean Thomas, again in the building with episode 29 of the Be More Today show. We're back, we're back, we're back in the building. And folks, I'm excited, as always, just to connect with my friends and my family. But um, this was a, a rough week. Um, major things have been happening around the world, as you guys know. You know, the, 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 the fires that are happening in California. Um, and of course, this past Friday, we had one of Brooklyn's finest, um, fall, Notorious R.B.G., um, which shocked the world. She has been a, a pillar for so many. She's been so instrumental in changing laws and maintaining uh, um, practices for so many Americans, so many people around the world. And um, they called her Nikki. I didn't know that was her nickname, a.k.a. Nikki, a.k.a. Notorious R.B.G. Uh, we want to give her a shout out and her legacy and uh, we pray for her family as, as they continue to go through all the changes that have been happening. Um, but a quote from her today is our, our thought. And she said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, when, no matter what we do in life, we want to make sure that we're making a difference and that as we're making a difference in people's lives, that you know, they follow us, that they, they, they come on board, that they help out. And you don't really know whose lives you're touching until you see people uh, uh, doing what you're doing or trying to do what you're doing or just following you when you're doing it. So no matter what you're doing this week um, or even for the rest of this year, I just want to encourage you guys just to go out there and, and do it well. Um, be the change that you want to see in the world and do it in a way where you're not the only one doing it, but you're actually inspiring others to follow your footsteps. Um, you'll always know if you're leading, if people are following you. You know, nobody leads and, and is followed by no one. If that's the case, then maybe you should be doing something else. But when you have other people trying to emulate you, when they're trying to follow your footsteps, or trying to be where you are, it's a good sign that you're heading in the right direction. So just continue to go out there, harness your craft, whatever it is, right? Whether it's in the medical field or, or, or not, anywhere you're doing stuff or in the legal field, wherever it's going to be, teachers, et cetera, um, make that difference. You know, there's some people who I've met who left a legacy in my life. And I know that RBG has left a legacy for so many others to go out there and fight the good fight. So I charge you in the name of the notorious RBG to go out there and make a difference in this world. That's my thought for today. And folks, I brought on somebody today who is doing that, um, not only has done that, but continues to do that. And he is my grit friend, uh, Dr. Stephen Haskins. Now, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Haskins is an MD, an anesthesiologist who has worked at the Hospital for Special Surgery, HSS, the top orthopedic hospital in the nation for 11 consecutive years. He's also a clinical assistant professor of anesthesiology at Weill Cornell Medical College, in addition to providing care for various patients undergoing orthopedic procedures, including many professional athletes. Dr. Haskins has an academic and clinical passion for point of care ultrasound, POCUS. POCUS uses ultrasound at the bedside to enhance clinical assessment and has been called the stethoscope of the 21st century. Dr. Haskins has been practicing, teaching, and promoting his initiative, or this initiative, clinical set in the perisurgical setting for almost 10 years and has taught or lectured on POCUS in 20 states, seven countries, and four continents. He's also the associate editor of a major anesthesia, anesthesia journal, the co-founder and chair of several US-based global anesthesia conferences, and has authored many notable academic publications. Born and raised in Michigan, Stephen moved to the East Coast to attend Choate Rosemary Hall, you know, the best school in the world. Let's talk about it. Graduating in 2000 as the first African-American legacy since its founding in 1890. Stephen graduated from Yale University with a BS in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology, and then from New York University School of Medicine, where he received his MD with honors. He then completed an internship and residency at Weill Cornell New York Presbyterian Hospital and was chosen to serve as the chief resident during his final year. He even kept off his training by completing a fellowship at the Hospital of Special Surgery in Regional Anesthesiology and Acute Pain Medicine. 
Besides his clinical and academic work, Stephen enjoys spending time with his wife of 12 years and his three-year-old son and has a passion for singing, having sung his whole life. In college, while the business manager of his a cappella group, Shades of Yale, he helped to fundraise for and organize a trip to South Africa to perform for the crowning ceremony of one of the kings there and was honored to sing for the icon, Nelson Mandela. Although he mostly supports his artistic friends and enjoys nights of NYC karaoke, we're gonna talk about that. He recently joined the band PLXS as the lead singer. He also has recently become a long distance running fanatic and is training for the 2020 NYC Marathon. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pets included, introduce to the stage my friend from Church with Mary Hall, my grit gang boy, Dr. Stephen Haskins. Stephen, what's going on? Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Honor, honored to be on the show. I'm just happy you're here. Um, you know, we reconnected at my book launch, which was awesome. I hadn't seen you in years before then. And um, I just got to say thank you for coming out and supporting me there. I really appreciated it. It's, it's awesome when, you know, people who haven't seen each other for years can still reconnect on Facebook, clearly. But to actually come out um, and support and, you know, and you supported my movement with the Be More Today stuff, I really appreciate it. And then we reconnected again with this grit challenge that we did. Um, and shout out to all our grit guys, our grit game boys, Jamel and, and uh, Show Rock and uh, Rob Mandel. And, you know, we had this, this whole crew of people coming together, getting these miles in Gerard. Um, and that by itself was insane. And shout out to Jamel Melville, whose birthday is actually today. So all the way from California, we want to say shout out to you. Happy birthday to you. Um, but Stephen, how are you doing? What's going on with you? COVID-19, how is life? How are you feeling? You know, as good as you can be uh, this year. It's, it's This has been a rocky one for a variety of reasons. Uh, obviously, we're all going through the same uh, social pain uh, that that this has put on us in terms of isolation and, uh, and you know, having to do a lot of things that normally we've, we've relied very heavily on, uh, you know, structured institutions to do for us, like education and, and uh, you know, getting around. Uh, I, you know, make, making it one day at a time. This year was, uh, it, it was interesting because it was supposed to be a very big year for me um, from an academic perspective. Uh, and you know, my work has me traveling a lot um, as a result of being able to go and give lectures and workshops. And, and, uh, and that all just came to a screeching halt. So it just uh, had to reorient myself from that perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been good in many ways to, to, to refocus a lot kind of at the home base uh and um yeah some days are harder than others like uh, friday was a pretty rough day <laughs> as you can imagine. yeah well you know I, I i know it's probably been tough for you since with the COVID 19 stuff i mean you're really on the front lines in the hospitals um we were seeing patients clearly as physical therapists but you were really on the front lines seeing all kinds of people so i know you've probably seen the worst of many especially in new york city where i just saw yesterday they put up a stats that said we had 200,000 deaths in the U.S. And of those 2,000 deaths, there were 33,000 from New York. So we got hit. Um, those of you who've been in New York, you know how, how crazy it has been. So as we're in a better-ish place now, we're just hoping that things continue to level off and we get to some sense of normalcy. Um, but I know you've been doing great work, too, so I, I want to salute you and appreciate you for that. Um, so you and I went to Church with Mary Hall together, the best school I always claim in the world. Um, and, you know, we ran track together, which is awesome. We actually, I forgot that we had a school record that we shared together for the four by 400 meter relay. And I don't know, if, I think you guys broke that when I left. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but we also, we, yeah, <laughs> we sang together in Milagro's. And um, we had this uh, ongoing thing called Freaky Friday that we did where we did talent shows and we sing everything from Drew Hill to Usher. And, you know, we we got another. The thing is, I, I, I can sing, but you can really sing. Like, I can kind of sing, kind of, but you actually sing, sing. And uh, you held us down for so many things. So I just want to re really appreciate you for that. And. I'm glad you're still singing to this day, which is awesome. 
Um, the main reason I want to have you on the show today, Stephen, is I want us to talk about your 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 legacy. Now, I didn't realize that you were the first African American um, legacy at Chope since 19, 1890. Um, who in your family went to Chope before that, and what was that experience like? Uh, Dad went to show. Um, he he attended from 1969 to 1972. He was actually a part of a program called A Better Chance, so ABC, and uh, and it was a, a program that essentially looked at inner city uh, populations and, and found um, you know really you know bright uh, you know uh, kids, uh, amazing people doing well academically and they uh, they sort of took those kids put them in an intensive summer program um, and uh, and helped integrate a lot of these schools um, across America uh, um, my uncle actually went to Avon and my older uh, uncle uh, he's older than my sorry he's older. Avon first and then my brother uh, then uh, and you know so this this was a program that allowed uh, you know uh, people from uh, sort of not the stereotypical circumstances where you would expect them to go to a prestigious uh, organization, uh, you know, or school like Chopper's Mary Hall, um, to integrate those those uh, those classrooms and and also you know hopefully change their trajectory in in life uh, to make it possible for them to get opportunities that that are often provided to uh, to people who graduate from those sort of prestigious. And so. My father went in 1969, in 1970s when they actually um, uh, sort of brought brought the uh, Rosemary Hall component into to Choate, and it became a, uh, a a sort of you know both both male and female they had both genders available. So it was a lot of change happening at that time. Um, you know, so you start seeing people of color show up. You start you know having women on campus. Um, obviously, the 60s and, and the early 70s there was. A, you know, the civil rights movement was sort of in full swing. Uh, and, and it was probably around that time that the, that the natural sort of backlash that goes along with uh, a lot of these progressive movements was, was starting to, to kick in as well. And so you're seeing, you know, uh, sort of very sort of fringe uh, components, uh, you know, uh, outspoken, bold movements uh, like the Black Panther movement, and you're seeing a similar backlash. From, uh, from the white community. Uh, and so, uh, in short, my father did not have a good time in Chopin. <laughs> he did not really enjoy his experience. Um, uh, he doesn't have too many fond memories of, of being on the campus, uh, being, being the scholarship, you know, black kid, um, uh, you know, integrating the school uh, was not, uh, from, from what he's expressed to me, sort of, you know, uh, and and as a result of that, um, you know, he went on to Wesleyan, which is probably one of the most <laughs> sort of liberal uh, colleges in in the Northeast. Uh, probably as a as a reaction to to the experience that he that he had in Choate, and and it really wasn't um, at all in his his life trajectory that his kids would, would necessarily go to Choate and follow in his footsteps. But uh, life happens uh, to you know, and, and sort of. Uh, serendipitous ways, and, and in, in this circumstance, uh, one of his classmates, uh, although he's uh, junior to him, um, Tim, Tim Bradley, as you probably know, uh, from Chicago, and, uh, and went to show with my dad, uh, was hired uh, in the admissions office at Joe Rosemary Hall, and, uh, and I think he was personally charged with um, a, a desire to bring, you know, uh, more diversity and, and also create uh, you know, a, a meaningful legacy for his, for his uh, time. Um, got uh, got um, my, my knocked up younger than, <laughs> than a lot of his friends. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, my, my brother, my sister and I were the right age to uh, to apply to show um, while most of the other people in their, in their cohort still had much younger children. And so my sister and I applied, uh, we actually both got in, but my sister, because of her uh, age, she would have started as a junior. Um, which would have been a very and from an educational perspective, but just socially, she was so, you know, ingrained in, in her you know, school. Ultimately, you know, I was the one who uh, decided to, to go and, and, uh, and the rest is, 
That is incredible. Um, yeah, I talked to, well, Tim Bradley is a, is a good friend of ours, clearly. He was back at the when we were there. Um, also supported Be More Today, which I appreciate. He's been great. I got to have him on the show at some point in time. But it's so interesting, the connections. Um, and I didn't know any of this about you. Um, I know you have such a long time. I had no idea about the legacy and, and any of those things. But it's also so cool just to recognize everyone's journey is different. And um, the fact that you were the first legacy student um, just show that the full circle of, of that movement is, is amazing. And, and it's, it's funny, I always think about Cho as being a place where, you know, people just love to be there, but there were people who were there, whether they were back in your father's day or even in current times who had some issues with, um, you know, where it was located and diversity and those kind of things that come together when you bring so many people together from various places. So it's interesting to see everyone's perspective, even though they've been in the same thing, it can be very, very different. And um, I thank you for sharing that. Um, now, Stephen, you're actually our first medical doctor on the show. Um, so I, I, I wanted you to share your, your journey, I guess from Cho, um, through medical school and to how you chose anesthesiology as your preferred uh, specialty. Has been curious when it comes to science, and and uh, I, you know, I always sort of tell this anecdote that when I was a, a kid, I have a very sort of clear recollection of someone asking me what I wanted to be when I would grow up, and I said, I either want to be a singer or a doctor. Um, <laughs> uh, so you know, sometimes you plant that seed early enough, it it, it does sort of uh, it resonates and and it kind of sticks with you, and so. Um, I, I, I enjoyed science uh, a great deal um, uh, throughout high school. Uh, I actually took organic chemistry my senior year at Choate just to, to sort of, you know, get that experience because uh, I knew that was kind of the big, that was the big class uh, that, that everyone that sort of weeds out everyone in the pre-medical, uh, you know, track. Um, and so, and so, you know, I, I always sort of saw myself in that light. Um, and so during my uh, time at Yale, I explored it. I explored science in two capacities. I explored it from a re research perspective and I explored it from a clinical perspective. And uh, it was done in very different ways. The summer after my freshman year, I actually went back to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I got a job um, working as a, an assistant to a radiology technician, essentially the person that uh, performs CAT scans um, for the latter half of the day. And, and most of the time it would be sort of patients that are admitted through the emergency room and, and you'd, you'd see sort of standard things and then you'd occasionally see some very sort of, uh, you know, impressive and tragic and, you know, uh, horrific, you know, depending on the circumstances. And, uh, and every day I just, I looked forward to, you know, what was I going to see next? You know, what was this experience going to be like? I just, I really, I really enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, I learned a lot um, and, and I could see myself in that type of environment. Um, and then I was fortunate to, to uh, get uh, this fellowship. It was called the Mellon Boucher Fellowship, and it was for uh, students of, of color at, um, to be able to pursue uh, different sort of, uh, you know, academic research uh, opportunities. And so I actually worked with, uh, with in, in a um, genetics lab, I guess you'd, just, you'd describe it, um, worked with a, with a very prominent scientist um, uh, who helped discover um, RNA-P, which is, I'm going down a long pathway here, but essentially he was the first person to discover that RNA had the ability to have uh, the sort of enzymatic activity like proteins do, and he actually, he won a, a Nobel Prize for it. Um, and so I, I was in this elite lab working in, you know, with a, an elite group of, of postdoctorates, um, but day in, day out, uh, doing that type of research is, it's very sort of like, you know, you work on things for months and, and then they don't necessarily pan out. And it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't give me that same day-to-day -day enthusiasm that I was looking for um, and, and ultimately felt when I was in the, uh, in, in, you know, dealing with the uh, CAT scans with patients after they, you know, are, are coming in and out from the emergency room. And, uh, and so at, at that point, I knew that my passion was more for, for uh, pursuing science in a clinical perspective than, than pursuing something like a PhD. Uh, I applied to med school and, uh, and it's, it's to, to kind of wrap your head around. Um, but you ultimately, you have to take the right classes and you have to study for the MCAT and you, and you have to, you know, make sure that you apply broadly. And, and I was very fortunate to be accepted into NYU 
um, and recruited there. Uh, and that was just a, such a phenomenal experience to be able to come to New York uh, to work um, with, you know, very talented uh, professors and, 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 you know, future colleagues, but also to have the Bellevue experience um, during our clinical years, which to be, um, uh, you know, a clinician, to be a physician, you know, what it's going to be like day to day taking care of patients because you're really thought I was going to be a surgeon. Uh, that, that, was, that was always sort of in the back of my mind. Um, I started with the surgical rotation. I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, but I, I saw that, you know, with the, the sort of prestige of being uh, there comes a, a great deal of sacrifice, uh, uh, personal, uh, and it becomes all-consuming. It becomes your your end-all, be-all. And um, and I think you'll find that a lot of people in our our generation are gravitating towards fields that allow for a little bit more of a work-life balance. Uh, the opportunity to think about your life as a physician, as a, you know, as someone who takes care of patients, but also um, looks to find some meaning in things outside of their work. Um, the traditional sort of uh, stereotype of the workaholic physician who, you know, it's, and that life is everything and it, and it comes first before, um, uh, is I think fading a little bit with our with our generation. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, affecting patient care, but it is I, I think making the lifestyle and the well-being of those who are taking care of patients a, a little bit uh, better. And so I ultimately gravitated towards anesthesia because it was an opportunity for me to be in the operating room to have a procedural based subspecialty to to take care of patients in with that level of acuity that you would in, in, a, in a surgical setting, but also have the capacity to, to have some work-life balance and, and not necessarily have your work be the end of, of you know, who you are. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's incredible. I think that journey, I agree with you on, on the fact that I think a lot of our people in our generation are definitely um, veering more towards a balance. Um, and, you know, you have now professors like PA and PT that really give that opportunity to be available for us to kind of get in. I mean, I, that's why I chose it, to be honest. Um, I know the PA is probably the closest thing to what you guys are doing with less schooling, but you know, you know, you're still kind of there in that, in that environment. Um, but I agree that workaholic mentality is changing. And I think, like you said, it's, it's not a bad thing that people are finding ways to give their all to their profession and so give their all to their community or to whatever else they're giving them, themselves to. Um, my question for you about anesthesia is that for those who are listening, I mean, if, you, if you've been like me, you've had the dental visit or you've been like me also had surgery, um, how does it work? Like how does anesthesia work in terms of you go in there, what's your regular procedure and, and the things that you do to make sure that the patient is sedated um, and how does it how differ for, you know, someone who maybe um, varies on their weight or their height, um, all those things. What's kind of the science behind it? It is a unique intersection between understanding sort of the, the medical aspect of a person, right? Their, what's their medical history? What's what, you know, what comorbidities do they have? You know, do they have heart disease? Do they have lung disease? You know, um, do they have renal disease? You know, all these things that affect uh, the way that they're going to respond to surgery and anesthesia, and then understanding the surgical procedure, right? So what's going to be done, um, what, what's going to be needed in terms of making sure that that patient is uh, not aware during the case, um, is re adequately relaxed for the surgeon to operate, is comfortable throughout uh, so that there's no unnecessary stress put on their, on their body and is, is comfortable afterwards and, and, and obviously, you know, uh, is, is uh, amped throughout because no one wants to be aware during the afterwards when things can, you know, control or if someone has to remain having a breathing tube in place. So, the, you know, the way that I think about it is you have to categorize it sort of based on um, what's being done, right? So there are sort of uh, these low risk procedures, uh, things like colonoscopies or endoscopies, or maybe having, you know, an appendectomy. 
uh, you know, laparoscopically performed, uh, moderate risk procedures, that's these orthopedic operations that we often deal with, um, things where you're placing a hip or a knee or having a spine surgery where there's a decent amount of blood loss and there can be stress on, on your heart and your lungs and, and, and your kidneys and other organs. And then there's the high risk surgeries that are the big blood loss or the cardiovascular surgeries where you're having you know, bypass or the replacing a valve um, in your heart, uh, brain surgery. Uh, things that things that are guaranteed to be sort of a lot more challenging, and so you have to you have to approach it based on you know the complexity of the operation, um, the, the 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 illness and age of the patient. Um, if they are very old but healthy, um, they may respond uh, similarly to anesthesia as someone who is sort of middle aged but not that healthy, just because there are a lot of different uh, variables. Um, uh, into how you respond to blood loss and, and the anesthetic agents that we give. Um, and, uh, and then you, you want to make sure that the, the, you're thinking about the entire experience, right? What, what it means for them to come in beforehand and be adequately optimized if possible for surgery, uh, how you deal with them uh, intraoperatively so that obviously they're, they, they wake up at the end of the case and, and, uh, and then pain control, which is usually the biggest concern for patients. Um, mm -hmm is, you know, how, how am I going to recover um, so that way I can work with physical therapy adequately and, and pain control is a big help. I did training, uh, additional year of, of training and after my residency was in regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. And, uh, and so I did that uh, additional year of training to learn how to specifically use these tools to improve uh, the intraoperative and postoperative uh, pain experience uh, for, for a lot of patients. And so one of the things that we do fairly routinely at our hospital is, is peripheral nerve blocks, uh, spinals and epidurals. And, and what those do is they allow us to inject local anesthesia in and around nerve groups uh, to numb them up for an extended period of time. So that way, the, the, the effect of a surgery, um, your brain isn't necessarily registering it. And if your brain doesn't register it, then you don't have the, the sort of sympathetic reaction where your heart is racing and your blood pressure goes up and that can cause more bleeding. And, and you know, they, they all sort of feed into each other. And then ultimately the recovery, uh, when you wake up and you're not in any pain after having major surgery, um, you know, that has a big impact on your, on your psyche and your ability to get up and start moving immediately after a you know, major operation. Um, and, it, and it does, uh, you know, improve outcomes. It's, it's been demonstrated. Blood anesthesia, but those are <laughs> took me a while to, to, to get it. So I, you know, I would be a very, very long podcast if I, if I, if you want me to talk about all the nuances, but hopefully that was a, a helpful overview. <laughs> exactly what I was looking for. Now in this specialty, you have um, found your niche and have specialized in this treatment or this procedure called POCUS. What is POCUS, a point of care ultrasound exactly? Is, uh, is something that's been around for some time and it's probably been most commonly used in emergency rooms. Uh, and what we are doing is we're using ultrasound at the bedside and we're using it as a means to evaluate patients. And uh, you mentioned it uh, in the introduction, we often describe it as a 21st century version of the stethoscope. Right. Listen to patients at the bedside, we now use ultrasound to, to, to look inside of them and be able to assess for what is often sort of obvious uh, and clear pathology and could potentially be life-threatening pathology. And, and um, you know, I think that the main thing to understand when it comes to managing patients who are in acute or in a critical type state, so they're, you know, in respiratory distress, you know, having difficulty breathing, um, what we call hemodynamically unstable, meaning their blood pressure is very low and they look very sort of sick and tenuous, is that on the outside, a lot of these patients look almost identical, right? You walk up to them and they're pale and, and they're sweating and, you know, they, they look, they feel miserable and they look miserable. Um, and there, you know, maybe 20 or 30 different things that could be the source of that. And when we see a patient like that, we need to act very quickly to try to address those things. And mm -hmm. one additional tool that we can use at the bedside is to, to grab an ultrasound and to start looking, um, start looking for things that could either diagnose what's going on with that patient or potentially, you know, sort of rule out uh, worrisome uh, comp uh, um, 
comorbidities or, or, or complications at that point. So I, I brought I brought my my toy um, just to show off a little bit. Uh, I call it a toy. Obviously, it's a tool. Um, but this this is uh, this is my um, uh, sort of I guess sound pro that I can plug into my iPhone, um, and uh, and I can actually literally go bedside to bedside if I need to and scan patients, uh, look at their heart, look at their lungs, look at their stomach. Uh, you know, anesthesiologists are often concerned about whether a patient's stomach is full because if uh, we relax them, that can end up in their lungs and cause sort of deadly consequences. Um, uh, you know, uh, look, look, at, look at multiple different uh, organ systems and use this to help uh, diagnose or potentially guide management of sick patients. And so when I say the 21st century version of the stethoscope, I mean it's because these things have gotten to the point where they're small enough, portable enough, and affordable enough that you can literally purchase them as an individual and use them in the same way that you would use a stethoscope to, to listen to a patient's heart. Hmm. So this, I, you know, I'm happy to demo this later if you like, but this is, a, you know, I think it's pretty remarkable that we have these devices now. See, so it just plugs right right into my uh, my iPhone and, and I'm ready to go. Uh, so that's incredible. That's awesome. I mean, we've had a couple of people on the show who were tech experts and talk about the the ever changing like technology that's used for all kinds of different businesses. But literally, that right there, like you said, I get it now. Um, it really can revolutionize everything. And uh, the fact that it's so portable to connect to your phone that's 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 awesome. That's incredible. I think that that, like you said, is going to be a game changer. Um, so that that right there makes me very inspired. Um, and I think that the the we the well the work that you've been doing clearly is no surprise to anyone is remarkable. Um, I'm always been impressed with you, Stephen, from from day one when we met, and I, I knew that you'd be doing great things. So no surprise that you've become so accomplished in what you've been doing. Um, talk to us a little about your your teaching now, because now I mean you do clinical stuff, but you also teach these practices and um, foundational learning things to to students. What's that like being on the professional or professor end, should I say? And, and how do you enjoy teaching? Um, it's great to be on the other side in general of, <laughs> of training because it's a long it's a long road. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I love teaching. It's something that I, I have always been very passionate about. Um, and it was uh, wonderful for me to to learn these skills and then see that there was such a remarkable sort of broad application for clinicians and anesthesiologists uh, um, to help improve patient care. And so the first thing that I kind of did was I, I helped to teach some of my colleagues uh, and then uh, I started teaching residents and fellows um, how to use these tools. And, and that sort of kept to opportunities to teach, uh, as I mentioned, sort of across the country and international opportunities as well, because uh, so the more people got exposed to this and the more they, they realized how important this particular tool was to anesthesiologists, um, then, you know, I happened to be one of the handful of people who was kind of really out there uh, on, on the road, uh, you know, day in, day out. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the ability to, to uh, make it so that they can wrap their head around it and start using it immediately. Uh, so, so it's, it's been wonderful. I, I, um, as I said, I started early with a lot of focus on our residents. I was very fortunate. I won Teacher of the Year uh, three years in a row early on because of that sort of effort. I think they really sort of sense that, you know, the effort and the energy, the organization, the teaching um, uh, was was meaningful for them. And then, and now it's it's sort of evolved, and I I've been tasked with the with doing things on a higher level to try to have a broader influence on, on almost, you know, all anesthesiologists. It's, mm. it's nice to focus in on the core that you're working with, but if you really want to make an impact, it has to be done. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So teacher, uh, clinical clearly and singer. Now I figured you were going to sing after we left Choke Cause I mean, you, you, you were the voice of Milagros when we were there together. Um, you went to go into a group called Shades of Yale. Um, what was that group like? And how did this trip to South Africa come about? So 
of Yale was actually the youngest of uh, 13 a cappella groups at Yale. So Yale has a very sort of long and and uh, and sort of storied history of a cappella, with the Whiff and Poofs kind of being the, one of the first a cappella groups. And was was the new kid uh, on the block, and it was it was uh, brought about in in the late 80s because there was no group that was really singing. Uh, music of the African diaspora, so consistently singing R and B and jazz and soul and gospel and and representing that that element of of the uh, sort of American musical history. So obviously, you know, by nineteen or sorry, by uh, two thousand when I joined, they they'd been around for a little over a decade. They were still a relatively new group, but uh, but had more footing uh, in terms of experience and and scope and exposure. Uh, it was sort of a, we were actually a favorite group of the president of the university would always sort of invite us out to perform every year at his in celebration. Uh, and so it was, it was a natural group for me to gravitate towards because um, they were musically excellent. They sang music that I loved, that I grew up listening to um, and that I wanted to, that I wanted to keep singing. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately it was a group that had, you know, a, a huge amount of potential, um, and uh, and that's I think that's sort of the the story of of being uh, you know a sort of upstart minority group in an elite institution like that. As you know, the the people who are there are incredible, but you may not necessarily have the resources and the history and the foundation that group's been around for 50, 60, you know, a hundred years have. Uh, and so I uh, was fortunate to to collaborate with Peter Hasegawa, who actually was. Um, uh, a Chody also, and he joined Shades uh, the year after, and he was in um, My Arrows with me actually, and uh, and he joined Shades, and he was a he was a um, a, a go getter, and really had big bold plans for for the organization, uh, and I was a an executor. <laughs> uh, he you know he kind of was like the 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 CEO type, and I'm the COO type, uh, and so. Uh, he just he he saw that that the group had incredible potential that we should be doing great things and that we shouldn't be settling, you know, settling for trips to Atlanta when we should be going to Japan and South Africa and and uh, and by the end of uh, you know our our tenure at Chode we did go to Japan and we did go to South Africa um, and that was a part of our our legacy uh, but the 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 as is always the case you have to be someone who's willing to just keep talking and keep pushing and so he met someone who was an advisor to a a rising uh you know king a tribal king in south africa the the bafo king nation had these huge platinum and chrome uh mining resources on their land that had been confiscated during apartheid um and had been sort of mined uh by the by the afrikaner regime and now they got that land back and so they had all these resources they actually built um a, uh, a a soccer stadium that was used during the World Cup in South Africa. Um, their their soccer stadium was one of those stadiums. So so they had these resources, but they didn't necessarily have again that tradition of education and excellence. And uh, because of the fact that they were sort of for decades because of apartheid. And so the the, the king had actually studied abroad. Um, he he studied in, in uh, England and, and in the US and one of his advisors was a Yale professor and she knew about us and she said, you know, you got to meet this group um, about things that, that, that really relate to the, the struggle um, in South Africa. And one of our songs is in Kosi Sikileli Africa, which is the, the um, uh, sort of national anthem uh, of, of South Africa. We would sing that very proudly and started singing that during the anti-apartheid. Uh, movement in in the late 80s and early 90s uh, mm -hmm. and so when we performed for them uh, uh, we performed for him we actually we just got up one day and drove to Providence Rhode Island because he was he was just there for a visiting um, uh, opportunity and he said you got to come out and you've got to you got to perform at my enthronement ceremony which was happening we just made it happen it was a lot of work but we we made it happen and and we got a group out there to sing uh, in this soccer stadium in front of, you know, tens of thousands of, of South Africans and, and in audience uh, and attendance that day was, was Nelson Mandela. We didn't get to meet him, unfortunately, but he was, he was there. And, uh, and, you know, that, that was something that I think was a very big moment for, for our group. It, it showed 
we we're we know that we're capable of we just we just have to get outside of the 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 box that a lot of uh you know again minority groups are put in which is that you know you have a short history and you don't have a lot of resources so don't dream big you know and it's like well we're at yale like we gotta dream you, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you should be dreaming big and mm -hmm. uh and the group has continued to go on uh, and do amazing things since then wow so i forgot you were in my arrows um completely forgot about that so you mentioned it just now and then um you know funny enough brown had a group called a brown um it was a very similar group to you guys i mean it was i don't know if, if shades of yeah was um um guys and girls or not but uh james brown was okay yeah so very very similar to you guys um and i don't know if you guys ever did any kind of collaboration between you guys but um it's 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 awesome to see a lot of these institutions you know brown yales harvard they're all kind of in the same boat for the most part but um in terms of the minorities coming together and and just making a way and paving a way um it's great to see that that happens in in various places and yale's one of my favorite schools to go to because it was in Connecticut, clearly. So I used to love just going to visit their campus for track meets and what have you. Um, but I'm just, that, that, that story is amazing. And the fact that he was actually in the audience hearing you sing um, is something that you can tell your children, you know, or your, your son at some point in time, which is a legacy that cannot be ever taken away. Um, so as an artist, you also have artist friends. Now, I have artist friends but I don't have your kind of artist friends. So I need to know, I, I've, I've seen this, I've been trying to ask this question for a long time and I figured the Be More Say Show is the best place to ask, ask it. Uh, John Legend, how did this happen? How do you guys know each other? Um, and what's the backstory between you guys? With most things in my life, uh, even though it seems like I'm like an accomplished and meaningful person. Uh, I, I married up, uh, so <laughs> so so my wife is 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 significantly more accomplished and impressive in many ways. Uh, so she actually is a singer as well, my wife, and she sang um, at Penn. She was in a group called uh, uh, Counterparts, um, and uh, and John Legend was in the singing group with her. So. so when he was a senior uh and he was as you can imagine just you know brilliant a ear and was an incredible musician and composer and singer and personality and uh and so anyone who was smart uh stayed in contact with him and supported him throughout the course of his career and so i i actually met my wife in 2000 and five um and uh she had just graduated from law school at that point i guess 2006 um john had just come out with his first sort of major hit album uh the the fall before ordinary people uh so i was a big john legend fan before before I, I i got to meet him uh you know through through my wife uh and so we we uh we stayed in touch for many years um he actually came to our wedding and uh, performed at our wedding uh that was actually the first wedding he attended with chrissy Teigen. um uh, they were just starting to kind of date at that point and get serious um and we went to we went and attended his wedding in lake como uh back in 2013 um, and, you know, we were sort of in and out uh, when he lived in New York, we'd see them more frequently, uh, birthday parties and get together. And, uh, so they got two kids and they live in LA and, you know, they're, they're, he's, he is no longer a star. He's like a super duper duper star. So, uh, so we, we continue to wish them the best and hope for the best, but, uh, but we're not as close as we, we used to be. Uh, back when you know he was just a a, a star. star. Um, <laughs> so that's that's the the short uh, story with John Legend. But I do I do actually am very fortunate to have um, many talented friends from uh, who I you know who I sang with in college, and some have been nominated for Tonys and and uh, been in many incredible shows on Broadway, and I get to go see them and and root them. You know, 
think about what if, what if, what if I decided to go down the singing path instead of go to med school? But anyway. Yeah. Well, you now you have your group. Now talk to me about your group because I've seen you guys have been doing a lot of perform well, before COVID. Clearly, um, you got a couple of shows with your group. What's your group like exactly? Uh, it, it's a very appropriate group because it's mostly people that um, come from work. <laughs> so it's a uh, so the lead of of the uh, of the band is um is a hand surgeon named Steve Steve Lee, and so the group is actually called Plexus. Um, they shortened it to PLXS, but as you know brachial plexus yeah. he actually does he does very like major brachial plexus reconstructive surgery so yeah, cool. um so, <laughs> slash name uh but so they, they he's been around with he created that group many years ago um and his uh his niece was actually a lead singer and and the the basis for the band is someone who's sort of the sales rep at our institution uh and uh and i saw them perform um and i just kind of approached him and i said hey you know i'd just wanted you to know I'm a singer. I'd love to, you know, collaborate with you guys at some point, you know, singing a song or two. And he, he kind of was like, yeah, sure. You know, we'll see. We'll see. You know, uh, and uh, so I played some of my recordings for him. And he was like, okay, you're pretty good. And, you know, and, and we got together one day in his office. He had his acoustic guitar and we just sang some songs. And he was like, all right, well, turns out we don't have a lead singer anymore. So you want to be our lead singer? And I was like, oh, okay. All right. I guess, uh, I guess we'll just go all in on this then. Uh, so we, we did a fundraiser event uh, last June and then um, not this, you know, obviously 2019. And that was my first uh, real performance in many years. I, I hadn't really uh, done anything since med school. Yeah. It's like res residency fellowship. I got a started career. Um, so before you know, 10 years plus have flown by since I'd done anything like that. And it was just, it was, cathartic to get up on stage and like be able to like sing it uh, in in October and we were planning for one in July and then you know the world ended so <laughs> so back to back to you know singing in the shower or whatever but uh <laughs> but we'll see well hopefully we can get back out there again once things settle out yeah last question before the break I don't know how you do all these things um working clearly at HSS, um, teaching. Um, you're an editor for the journal, right? Um, singing, of course, you're a husband, father. Uh, what's, and, and now you've been running, um, which by itself, you know, can take anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on how you're running or where you're running. How do you balance all this stuff? And, and what's your motivation to get all these things done? Well, it's multifactorial always, right? Um, so there's there's drive and desire and making it a priority. Um, and a lot of things in life, you just have to, you got to carve out time if it matters. And uh, and the other thing is, um, I, I happen to be in a very supportive relationship. <laughs> so, you know, it's one thing if, uh, if uh, you know, you don't have a kid and you can say like, I'm going to go for a four hour run. And it's like, thank God, get out, get out of the house like leave me alone right it's another thing if you're like i'm going to be gone for four hours on a weekend um because like i'm training for a marathon uh, do you mind just taking a period of time uh and uh and i am, i've been very fortunate to have uh you know a wife that supports what i'm doing at that time be it traveling a lot for work or training for a marathon or um, rehearsing for a show, uh, you know, we find ways to, to, to make it work. Um, and I do the same for her when she needs to do things. Mutually sort of supportive uh, relationship allows to you know, that. And, and, and if you really care about something, then you just, you just make it happen. Um, and it's, it really is that easy. You just say like, um, I, I have to rehearse, you know, 15 times before the show. So let's find the weekends and let's, you know, and let's find the, the evenings and carve it out and we'll just, we'll do it. So, but you know, if you're doing something you like, then it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like you're forcing it. It feels more like you get it, you make it happen and then you're there and you're in it. So. Well said, sir. If you're just joining us, I am with my friend, my longtime track and field buddy, 
uh, and acapella singer Dr. Stephen Haskins, anesthesiologist at HSS, uh, clinical professor at Weill Cornell Medical Center, uh, lead singer of Plexus, soon to be 2020 marathon finisher virtually. Uh, he does so many things and he is with us today. Now, Dr. Haskins, I, you came at my book launch. You know how we do with Be More Today. You know what we are, what we're about. Um, and I appreciate your support again. But I've been asking everybody what they think this theme means to them. So it is your turn. When you hear the phrase Be More Today, what does the phrase Be More Today mean to you? Hey, um, it makes me think about uh, the way we all felt on Friday when RB. Is that that is someone who left history, changed lives, um, made a difference, and and when she passed away, the world mourned. Um, and and I think that we opportunity as as humans you know our lives are as finite as they're going to be um be it 80 some years or 50 some years you know um but but to 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 achieve a legacy like rbg or steve jobs or even a chadwick boseman type of legacy um requires every single day um not succumbing to that doubt that you know this is not really gonna pan out why am i wasting my time on this, uh, not succumbing to uh, the desire to just put your feet up and say it's going to be easier to just, uh, you know, watch a show and have a glass of wine, um, uh, not succumbing to the fear of someone saying, no, uh, it's going to happen this time and having to reassess and, and, and start from scratch and, and begin. Uh, and I think anyone who who accomplishes great things and and has a legacy and is, and is remembered by um, those who obviously we're going to be remembered and, and and missed by our loved ones. Um, but to, to to have an impact on people who've never met you, um, uh, but but see what and and uh, and may have benefited from your work inadvertently or indirectly. Uh, to, to, to make more. Yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, now, you and I were 18 around the same time, right? That was basically our growing up or our, our, our graduating time around show going to Yale or Brown or what have you. Um, and we had a lot of advice that was shared with us at that time. And some we listened to and some we did not. But what's one bit of advice that you wish you had either listened to or as someone had shared with you um, when you were 18? 18 year old Steven, so many things I wish I could say to 18 year old Steven, right? I'm sure you feel the same way. Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think it would have been nice to just kind of sit me down and say, you know, it, it's okay to be confident and comfortable in your own skin, even though. I think you know there are, there are ways to to motivate yourself uh, and and have drive that are sort of you know positive and some are negative and it's just it's just part of who we are and and it's what what makes makes it happen and I, you know I think I think I I definitely was as an 18 year old you know about to matriculate you know from Chowers Murray Hall and and go to you know Yale University um, I had a big chip on my shoulder uh, as to what I wanted to do. And, who I was going to be, and I, and I think that that caused me to to think more about who that person is than who I was at that moment, and kind of be in the moment. Mm -hmm. We ask ask myself to like take a step back and and uh, and just you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Year old Stephen, it'll happen. You know, just enjoy. Yeah, yeah. What's one thing that is on your bucket list for either this year or just life in general? Um, yeah, um, two things that I think I 
want to do. One is sort of more of a long-term bucket list thing, and one is more recent. Uh, the long-term one was, I, I think I do want to go skydiving at some point. I just want to, you know, I just want to jump out of the plane. And mm. <laughs> I just kind of float float in the air and just the, the madness of of that, like, falling towards Earth. Obviously, I want to, you know, land and live. <laughs> So I, w- I will be attached to someone else, um, <laughs> but but that's something I think would be kind of fun. Um, uh, something less fun, but but something that has become more of a, a recent aspiration is to is to run an ultra marathon to do like a fifty miler. Um, I think that would be uh, just feel miserable and amazed at myself if I could accomplish it. Um, or the new running fanatic version of me. <laughs> yeah. Saying like, how far, how far can I push this? Um, uh, so we'll see. Hopefully one of those, one or both of those will happen at some point. Yeah. I don't know about this year. <laughs> right. So you know, the funny thing about this whole running thing is that, I mean, I know you remember being with Coach Harder and Coach Euchre at Choate. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I remember, if I remember correctly, you ran hurdles, right? You did. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, even <laughs> thinking about those workouts and you did cross country also um which okay yeah. <laughs> i left that after yeah well, we, <laughs> we, gotta lady, we gotta do this and coach Carter said if you want to run you gotta run cross country and i i even hated that but looking at the grit challenge that we did which again for the guys who are listening now remember we had to do 150 150 miles in a month um, and to go from doing nothing or whatever you were doing before, I was doing like minimal because of COVID and whatever else, to doing 150 miles in a month, that seemed, even on paper when we first talked about it, that seemed almost impossible. But when you're actually doing it, you know, when you're putting in the miles and you're, and you're balancing out how many miles to do each week and what you have left and just making and carving out time for it, we got it done. Um, and, and, and that, that by itself, I think, is the marathon mindset, like recognizing that 26.2 miles sounds insane. It sounds crazy. But if you work your way up to it, um, and then when you're actually preparing yourself for it, when it's done, it almost feels like, oh, I could definitely do, like you said, an ultra. So I know you can do an ultra. There's no doubt in my mind that Stephen Haskin can do an ultra marathon pretty much tomorrow if he had to, because he's already done the miles he has to do for the grip and has continued to run. So um Talk to the people about what you're doing though with this virtual 2020 marathon. Because I ran, I ran marathons and we were supposed to run this year, but we deferred for next year clearly. But there is a 2020 virtual marathon that you are being a part of. So talk to them about how you got into that and how we can support you with that venture. On, um, is it, so I have two things. I was going to run the marathon this year, and I was raising money for the American Cancer Society um, as as my fundraising goal to run the 2020 marathon, which is going to be the 50th anniversary marathon. And so, so I had that goal um, in mind, and I was going to be training for it. Uh, you know, um, I, as of, as of this summer, you know, regardless of uh, of, of sort of circumstances. COVID hit and that kind of blew things up. Um, and so, and so the, the, the 2020 marathon was not going to happen for me, um, but I still, in order to qualify for the 2021 marathon, uh, I'm going to keep fundraising for, for that through the American Cancer Society. Um, so uh, this is the American Cancer Society fundraising effort that I'm doing right now is so that way I can run the real thing uh, next year. Um, so I was fortunate that our institution, the Hospital for Special, Sur- Special Surgery, always um, has a lottery for, for the marathon every year. Uh, and this year they did it for the virtual marathon. I imagine not, that, not as many people signed up for it this year as usual. Uh, one of the questions they, they asked is whether or not um, you, know, you were a frontline worker. And I was. I was uh, working in, in the COVID ICU uh, during the surge. Uh, and so I was selected um, to get free admission to the to the virtual marathon, and uh, and believe it or not, that's a little bit more uh, sort of in my wheelhouse uh, running a virtual marathon than running an actual marathon. I probably run more long distances, you know, by myself, just listening to podcasts um, uh, than than. Well, actually, I, I definitely run more <laughs> runs long distance listening to podcasts than I have any real races. I've run like one real race in my life. Actually, I was supposed to run a real marathon. 
in March and it got canceled on the Wednesday before the race uh, because of COVID. So. Pick a path that I've run before uh, and it's, it's a fun path that involves, you know, many bridges and Central Park and, and running around Manhattan and, uh, and, you know, maybe I'll ask some people to be stationed at certain areas to like give me a little cheer. It's exciting to get a medal um, for running that distance. It's exciting to, to uh, you know, say that I've completed, you know, a marathon, be it virtual uh, or not, in a, in a real way. And it's, it's more motivation for me to, to keep training and pushing for, for next year. And, and I think, you know, this grit 150 um, challenge, which was just like, you know, whatever, July will be a light month and I can, you know, squeeze in some runs here and there and turned out, turned out to be like a real challenge. Uh, a lot of early mornings, a lot of like two day runs just to get those miles in. Uh, but who knew that that whole time I was training <laughs> for the NYC virtual uh, that I'm going to run on November, November 1st. So. Awesome. <laughs> so um, we're going to attach the link that um, people can sign up and they can support you for that um, with the podcast. We'll put that online so people can support you and then you can, I can actually follow you for the race as well on, on the first. Um, again, we're looking forward to doing the actual marathon that we're going to do all together next year, of course, but support Dr. Haskins as he goes on to do the virtual run on November 1st. Very exciting. And again, 10%, I'm sorry, 1%, 1% of the US population is in a marathon, 1%. It is not a big percentage of people who do this thing. So to be a part of that club uh, is, is a special thing. It's a very, very special thing. Um, so as you know, Dr. Haskins, I wrote a book called Be More Today, A 40 Guys for a Better Version of You. In the book, we talk about these steps, uh, steps to greatness is what I call them, things you want to start doing, stop doing, and then three goals for your life. I'm curious, um, what's something that you want to start doing this year? Um, and it may be the marathon, clearly, but what's one thing you want to start doing uh, or wanted to start doing for, for 2020? Hit. 2020 was going to be like a big year of, of uh, self growth and, and, you know, uh, health and, and all the, all the things that happen in a normal society when, when things are happening the way they're supposed to. Um, and, and unfortunately a lot of that kind of fell um, by the wayside. And so I definitely want to get back on track. I physically, the physical health stuff, uh, thanks to this again, grit challenge and training. Um, I think I've, I actually got COVID back in April, um, so I was sick, uh, and that that took a hit. I took a hit, you know, pulmonary wise, and just laying around. I mean, your body just sort of atrophies um, from just lack of activity. Uh, so, so it, that that was a major sort of setback for me, um, having just you know been in marathon training uh, condition to to kind of having to start from scratch again back in May. Um, so, so, uh, physically, I feel like I'm moving in the right direction. I think mentally and psychologically, there are things that I wanted to do more this year that have been challenging for me. And I, I think that everyone could benefit from some, you know, meditation, uh, you know, regular meditation, just kind of stepping outside of your mind, uh, and, 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 you know, your thoughts and, and the way that your, your, your mind is just constantly running and just kind of give it some peace. Uh, and I, I definitely want to do that. Uh, more regularly. Um, I, I actually started therapy for the first time in, in my life, uh, just to see um, what it would be like. Um, what I was looking for with, with the person that I you know, was doing it with. And so I ultimately sort of stopped that. But I do, I do see the benefit for it. I mean, the, I think there's a big uh, stigma associated with talking to a mental health professional and, uh, and um, particularly within, you know, the black community and, and um, people, you know, I'm like that, you're crazy. Um, but I think in the end, we all carry a lot of weight and we all have our, our history. Uh, and, and it's nice to have an objective person to, to fruitful conversation about you know what that means and how it manifests within within your your life and who you are. Uh, I think a lot of us 
do things like run marathons as a means to give ourselves that mental space and that and that therapy. Um, but you know, maybe it's worthwhile to to invest in that as well. So so those are the things I you know I hope hope to start and pick back up now that things are starting to normalize. At least it seems that way. We'll see what happens. <laughs> what happens in the fall. Yeah. What's one thing you wanted to stop doing this year? I, I sort of alluded to this before, um, 18 year old me, you know, planner and, and, you know, just constantly this chip on your shoulder. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Um, at this point, you know, with, with a son, you know, and, you know, family type of you know, perspective. Um, and, and also, you know, I put a lot of work in and I think the momentum has been generated and I, and I, I think I need to sort of take a step back a little bit and, uh, and, and, and stop trying to control so many different uh, aspects of, of what my life is doing and, and kind of let the momentum uh, carry it forward and sort of see what, what, what's the best. Mm -hmm. Control everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then one goal for your life, and it may have been the marathon, clearly, which is fine, but one goal that you had for 2020. Uh, yeah, I would, you know, the, the marathons were a big goal, um, eating uh, healthier, uh, which I, you know, was doing that and then fell off and back on that again. Um, uh, you know, like trying to get the, the, the mind and the body all uh, uh, back in sync. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling and a lot of work uh, within the last couple of years, and it definitely made me um, feel for to not like myself. And so, I, and interestingly, COVID kind of simultaneously threw that all off and may have helped uh, with it as well, just because it forced me to. to mm -hmm. Next, what am I preparing for that? Gotcha. Dr. Haskins, any final thoughts you want to share with the audience um, related to medicine, related to uh, plexus, related to running? Any final tips you want to share with everyone who is basically a, a, a fan of you like I am right now? I love this notion of, of be more today. And I told you sort of why I think that's the case, because I, I ultimately, I think it means a lot for, for an individual to realize that what, what they do matters, um, that, that even the littlest thing uh, can turn into something big uh, on, on the other end of a, of a, a big effort and a big push. Um, and that every moment you can decide to do something that's going to, you know, help get you to the next level or can, can help, you know, or can ultimately lead to a setback. And, and so every day matters. Um, every moment matters. Uh, you don't have to kill yourself every day and every moment, but, but, you know, try to be strategic and plan out ways to accomplish your goals and, and realize that, you know, you can take rest days, but, but you should ultimately, you know, stay, stay in the game and, and keep pushing. So on right you know it's uh <laughs> you keep you just keep training you keep running and you know you can stop and walk every now and then but uh, you know you just gotta get to that finish line so that's it <laughs> where can people follow you connect with you um are you on social media and if so what are your what are your tags uh, i am on twitter uh, so you can follow me there. Uh, I believe I'm S Haskins MD. Uh, so that's that's probably the easiest way. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't. I, I'm not as avid of a LinkedIn user. The best best place to 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 follow me, and you'll hear a lot of Pocus stuff on Twitter. That's kind of my that's my niche. Um, it's nice to find sort of like-minded uh, communities on Twitter. I think uh, a lot of people uh, who don't 
understand Twitter or, or worry or fearful of it, they say, well, I'm going to put out a tweet and like, you know, billions of people are going to read it. It's like, no, you're going to put out a tweet and like maybe one person will read it. Right. You know, you have to find, you have to find your community in Twitter. And once you do, um, then it becomes a, a, a opportunity to, to really be within a echo chamber of ideas um, and concepts. And, and so regional anesthesia and anesthesia and point of care ultrasound, I mean, I found sort of all the people um, who are on Twitter that care about those things. And so I can interact with them uh, academically or socially, and it's always fun to, to meet them in real life. Um, you know, put it mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Dr. Hassan, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your presence and taking the time out from your schedule to be on the show. We wish you the best with the marathon for November. And uh, we're going to put the link for your marathon with the, with the show so people can go out there and sign up and, and watch you run. We wish you the best. And uh, thank you so much for being here today. All right. <laughs> for those of you who no. are calling us from Big More today, thank you so much for joining us. And our quotation for today, again, by the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG. Fight for the things that you care about but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. We wish her and her family the best during this time. And for those of you following us Be More Today, continue to follow us. We are everywhere, right? We're on Be More Today for Facebook and Instagram, Twitter. Um, our webpage is still the same, bemoretoday.com. Anything that you want to look for, for our book, for our music, for our podcast information, it's all on there. And go to our YouTube page, bemoretoday.com for our workouts. We're putting out workouts every single Sunday that you guys can go on there and follow us for those workouts, um, as long with our Be More Today podcast from the Be More Today show and the Words for Life show, which comes out every single Wednesday. For those of you who have not joined us on Strava, please join our Strava group. We have a really fun Strava group out there right now. Dr. Hassan is a part of that group as well. And uh, if you're a runner or a biker, go on there and just be part of the group, be part of the movement, and just join the community of people who are out there running with us. To be more today's show currently is heard in 15 countries and it's growing, growing, growing all thanks to your support. So continue to watch us. And if you do want to support us in any way, you can go on the anchor page and become a monthly subscriber to just give us a dollar or whatever you want to give towards the show. Or on a be more today page is also a page to support. So support Dr. Haskins and his run, support be more today. And if you want to see anybody else on this show or have any ideas for things you want to see on the show you haven't seen yet. Send us an email, uh, be more number two day at gmail.com or any of our social media platforms as well. Send us a message there and we'll get back to you. Folks, thank you so much for joining us. And as I always say, have a good day, have a good night, have a great life, and continue to take your steps to greatness to be the best version of you. Peace! I'm gonna be a better